Right then, this video is uh, all about the CPU, and the CPU stands for Central Processing Unit. In other words, the processor, kind of the middle bit. And every computer has one, um, every mobile phone has one, your washing machine will have one, and so on. Uh, one from a computer might look like this. This one here is from an Intel Pentium 4 uh, sorry, it's an Intel Pentium 4 processor, so it's from a PC, um, and what you can see is there's a flat plate here which is called the heatsink, which is to take the heat away, and then here we've got chip uh, pins that are supposed to be straight, they're not very straight, they're a bit bent. Uh, these are all supposed to be straight, and there's some little chips and things on there. And I'm not too worried about going into the physical detail of what actually goes on kind of inside here, in terms of taking it apart and showing you the, the physical components but this is the thing inside your computer that does all the work and does all the processing so what is a CPU? what does it do? well the purpose of the CPU if you could ask this there are three purposes the first purpose is that it um, or the first, an first thing I would say if I'm answering that question rather is I would say it controls the computer okay that's a slightly simplistic answer but it's true, it controls the computer. The way it controls the computer is it fetches instructions. So if you've got a computer program, the processor goes and fetches them, so it's got them, and then once it's got them, it executes those instructions. Okay, so the processor, it kind of does one thing really, but there's, there's three parts to the answer. It controls the computer by fetching instructions and then executing them. Okay, so let's pretend for a second. I'll just draw you a quick diagram. Well, that's a good kind of stock answer for a straightforward question. Uh, but you've got your CPU, you've got your processor. You've got your memory or your RAM. And you've got your monitor or your VDU, Visual Display Unit. Okay, and what you want to do is you want to draw something to the screen. Okay, you've, you've done something, you've created something in a graphics package and you want to draw it to the screen. And so what happens is your processor has to get the instruction from the memory. Okay, so the instructions for the running program are over here. They get brought into the CPU, into the processor. So we've got the instruction. We then carry out that instruction, we execute it. And then once we've carried it out, we can then display it onto the screen. So the point is the processor has to get the instruction, execute it, and that's what it does. And everything you do, every single action you take, has to go through the processor, has to be used. Okay? Um, let's try something slightly different then. Right, then here's another way of thinking about how the CPU does what it does in terms of instructions. Okay? So here's my memory. In my memory, on my RAM, what I've got is I've got an address which is where each thing is stored and I've got some stuff that's actually stored okay stuff's a bit of a rubbish name but it kind of works and so in address number one I've got the start of my program and what it says is load whatever number is in address number 70 my second instruction is to add whatever's in address number 71 and my third instruction is to store whatever the answer is in memory address 72 and then we've got memory address 4 and 5 and 6 and then here's 70, 71, 72 and in 70 we've got the number 2, in 71 we've got the number 3 ok so here's my memory, in here we've got an address, an address number 1, an instruction to load whatever number's in 70 and the number in 70 is number 2 ok so this is the address, this is the stuff the stuff might be a number it might be an instruction, it might be a word, it might be something else entirely. Okay, but that's what I've got. Now what the processor does, so the CPU over here, what it does is it fetches the first instruction. So it comes along, it grabs the first instruction, and it fetches it into the processor, and so what we've got is load the number from address number 70. Address number 70 is the number 2. So we fetch and then we execute, and the execute is to go and get this number here and store that, so we go and we get the number and we bring it back we write it down, that's the execute okay, we call this the fetch execute cycle 
And then the next thing we do is we fetch the next instruction, which is here, so we fetch that one. And it says add 71. So the instruction is add 71. Then we execute that, we go and we get the number from 71. And we bring it back in here and we add it to what we already had. So 2 add 3 is 5. And then we fetch the third instruction, store 72. And what we do is we execute that instruction by writing the answer into memory address 72. Okay, now that's more detail probably than you need. It's a little bit complicated. But the basic gist of it is actually really, really simple. And that is that what your processor does is it goes to memory, it fetches an instruction. It fetches the next line of code. If you've done some programming, it goes and gets the next bit of the program it has to do. It then executes it by doing that bit of the program and then it goes and fetches the next one. So it's fetch and then execute and then fetch and then execute. Okay? So that's what a processor does, is it goes and gets instructions and it carries them out. Okay? Now processors, when you've got to buy a processor, there are certain features, certain characteristics you can look for. And they are things like uh, the clock speed, and that might be something like um, 2.6 gigahertz. Okay, we'll come back to that in a minute. Uh, we've got the cache size. So you might find it something like 16 megabytes. Um, and you've got the number of cores. So it might be a dual core or it might be a quad core. Okay, so I'm looking at a 2.6 gigahertz processor with a 16 megabyte cache and it's dual core. Okay, now what does that mean? What it means is that it will do 2.6 billion things a second. Okay? A hertz is one state change per second. Um, and so a kilohertz is a thousand. Okay? So one hertz is one thing per second. So one kilohertz is one thousand. One megahertz is one million. And one gigahertz is one billion. Okay, so 2.6 gigahertz is 2.6 billion things per second. That doesn't mean 2.6 billion lines of code. So if you've been programming in Python or Visual Basic or whatever, it doesn't mean it'll do 2.6 billion lines in a second, but it will do 2.6 billion things in a second. Okay, they're, they're a bit smaller than you'd imagine. Um, but obviously, if you had a 5.2 gigahertz processor, it's going to do twice as many things in the same space of time. And that's the point, the clock speed is a measure of how many things you can do in one space of time. Okay? So if I've got a 1 gigahertz processor and I've got a 2 gigahertz processor, then the 2 gigahertz processor can do twice as many things. It can carry out more instructions. Try not to worry too much about the twice as many. It can carry out more instructions in the same space of time. And in the same space of time, which I can't write because I'm too busy thinking ahead of myself. In the same space of time is a really important phrase. Okay, if you're answering this in an exam, and I'm, I'm making this video in kind of revision time, um, so I'm thinking about exams, we're talking about how many instructions we can carry out in the same space of time. With a 2 gigahertz processor, we can carry out more. It's not quite double, it's not quite that simple, but it's definitely more with a 2 gigahertz processor than it is with a 1 gigahertz processor, assuming everything else is the same. So if the only thing we change is the clock speed, then we're meaning more things can get done in the same space of time. Okay, have I said that often enough? Hopefully, right. What about the cache size then? Well, the cache size is to do with the amount of memory that's actually built onto the chip. If I show you my processor again, you can actually see some chips on the bottom of my processor. Okay, and what that allows me to do is that allows me to have some RAM, a small amount of RAM or a small amount of memory actually physically on the chip itself, on the processor. And what that means is I always talk about um, if you have to get something from the drawer versus if you have to get something from the shed. Okay? The drawer's a lot closer, it's a lot smaller so it's quicker to find things and it's quicker to get them back. If it's in the shed you have to go outside so it's further to get there, it takes a longer time to get there and back. It's also bigger, so it takes longer to find stuff, especially in my shed. Okay? So the cache is to do with how, how much data and how many instructions or how many programs, it's a bit fudgy, okay, how much data or how many instructions can be stored for quick access. 
okay quick access and so if you double the cache size if you had a 16 megabyte cache and you double it to a 32 megabyte cache what it means is you will be able to fetch instructions more quickly you'll be able to fetch data more quickly because you'll have more data in the cache that's there for quick access okay so again it's about fetching instructions more quickly having more instructions having more data close to hand for quick access okay so that's the advantage of increasing the cache size um, so again if you had a 2.6 gigahertz processor 16 meg cache dual core if you had one with a 32 megabyte cache it's not going to be twice as quick but you'll have twice as much data and twice as many instructions close to hand for quick access so it will run a bit quicker and then the final one is the number of cores and what we used to have is a processor would have one core and all the instructions would go in and all the instructions would go out dead simple and what we discovered was we could have two cores and if you have two cores you can have two sets of instructions going in and two sets of instructions going out now it's not quite twice as quick because you've got a bit of stuff here where you decide which path each instruction is going to go down it's very very complicated um, we're oversimplifying a little bit but the idea is if you have a dual core processor with two cores in that's going to be able to execute more instructions at the same time okay um, and so what that means is again you can carry out more instructions in the same space of time because you can split them between the two cores but it also means you could run more programs at the same time if you have one core and you're carrying out some instructions through that one core you can you know you can run that program that's fine if you try to run two big programs at the same time you might find your computer starts to slow down a bit so if you have a dual core processor you might find you can run more programs at the same time okay you can also carry out more instructions in the same time because you can split them between the two cores and if you've got a quad core well then obviously it's going to increase again I'm not sure why I'm drawing four boxes because you kind of know what quad core is by now I'm assuming okay and obviously you can have again more programs it's not quite the same as twice as many it doesn't quite work that simply but more programs running at the same time you can have more instructions executed at the same time the end result will be that you can get more, exe more instructions executed in the same space of time okay um, and that pretty much covers what's on the OCR syllabus in terms of the central processing unit so if you've understood all that Fantastic, go find some practice questions to answer um, and then come watch the next video later.